Hello, everybody, and this is a very special talk that I want to give tonight because one of my great passions is our national bard, Robert Burns. Robert Burns' celebrations take place in suppers throughout all the world on the 25th of January or round about that date. And they're great times of celebration of the values, his poetry and Scottish life. But I was asked a question at one stage about two and a half years ago, as Lord Lyon, would I grant Robert Burns a coat of arms and how would that be done? Well, of course, it's done in the usual fashion that a petition is placed before me uh, to actually consider whether the petitioner, and in this case, or Robert Burns, falls under my jurisdiction to be granted arms. Now, in this next slide, which is a slide about would Robert Burns be eligible for a grant of arms, I'm asking the very first question that any Lord Lyon must answer. To be granted arms, any petitioner needs to put in a formal petition in due form to the court of the Lord Lyon. Such petitions must establish that the Lord Lyon has jurisdiction. Now, Robert Burns himself was very keen on arms. He was part of a Scottish history in the late 18th century that used seals. And maybe this, all of the seals with the rings and their seals themselves had arms or some other heraldic device on it. Robert Burns, like many of his contemporaries, not only used these seals, but understood their significance. And he wanted to obtain a new seal in 1794. And in a letter, a letter to one of his correspondents, Alexander Cunningham, dated the 3rd of March, 1794, he wrote these words that ring through my head. I am a wee bit of a herald. Now, when I hear that, I know I'm going to be told that I've got some heraldic design wrong or that someone else knows better than the Lord Lion or the other people that produce the, the designs for me within the Lord Lion's court, that they actually have a base knowledge. And a base knowledge is important, but those words, I'm a wee bit of a herald. And then in the letter, Alexander Cunningham, he goes on to describe the arms that he would want. And it's a very romantic set of arms based on his understanding of his life uh, and his history uh, and also of Scotland of the day. But let's get back down to the business. Does the Lord Lion have jurisdiction to grant Robert Burns arms? Well, of course, that's an easy question for me to answer. The petitioner, Robert Burns, is of Scottish birth. He has Scottish parents. He's resident in Scotland. And all of these make him fit to come under the jurisdiction of the Lord Lion. In this next slide on jurisdiction, I'm able to answer that question very clearly. Robert Burns yes, yes, and yes, has jurisdiction in terms of the court of the Lord Lion to be granted arms. He was born in Alloway in Ayrshire in 1759. His parents were both Scottish. His father was from Kincardinshire, not far from my home. He had various residents throughout Scotland and several known addresses from Ayrshire to Edinburgh to Dunfries. Now, in the next slide, once I've established jurisdiction, there is probably the most difficult bit for me to determine. And I'm the sole judge of, of this particular question. The question would be, was Robert Burns a good and virtuous person? The statutes require me to actually establish that anyone who's granting arm, granted arms in Scotland, which is a great honour indeed, have to be good and virtuous people? The answer, of course, to this question would depend on who you spoke to. If you spoke to people of Robert Burns's time, such as the church, the lairds, the brethren of his own Masonic Lodge, the ladies, 
the men and women of his local inn, and the people of Scotland, you might get very different answers. But just remember, this very particular test, the sole judge to establish if a petitioner is a good and virtuous person, rests with the Lord Lion. It is within his discretion to establish that particular finding. Now let's leave that aside for a moment. Let's look to again in the next slide further at this test. Was Robert Burns then in his own time a good and virtuous person? Well, today I attend many Burns suppers and there's many views about this and about what Burns's life was about. His work and his reputation are turned over as the soils were turned over in the farms in which he worked. And many today still share a spectrum of views that reflect even the views of his own time. Let me be clear, if I was looking at the totality of the evidence before me in answering this question about Robert Burns, then on the balance of probabilities, in the context of his time, the answer would be yes, he was a good and virtuous person, despite many things that went wrong. So let me move now in our next slide to look at the circumstances around this petition. Robert Burns could in his own right apply for arms between the 25th of January 1780, which was his 21st birthday party, which was the age of majority uh, at that time, until his death on the 21st of July, 1796. He could have appeared in front of a number of Lords Lion between 1754 and 1794. It would be 95, sorry, between 1794 and 1795. It could be Lord Lion, John Hoot Campbell. But in 1795, it could have been Robert Bothwell, who was an interim Lion deputy, and between 1796 and to his death, it could have been the 10th Earl of Canool. For the purposes of this talk, I've decided that we'll deal with Lord Lion John Hook Campbell. And in the next slide, you can see a picture of him in his regalia of the time as Lord Lyon, uh, and you'll also see his shield on this particular slide. He was the second son of John Campbell of Codder. He lived mainly in Bath, which was a surprise to me, and very rarely came to Scotland. And he was killed on the 7th of September 1795 by falling over a pre precipice. So a very colourful character, but let's take it that Robert Burns's petition would fall somehow on his desk to be determined. Once that was done, in the next slide, you'll see the petition of Robert Burns, the poet. Unto the Right Honourable Lord, the Lord Lion, John Hook Campbell. And you'll see the words there, of the petition, which are very much similar to the words that an armager seeking to be recognized by the court of the Lord Lion would apply today. It gives the petitioner's father and mother's details, it gives the petitioner's residence, and it gives due respect to, to the office of the Lord Lion by asking for arms to be determined by the Lord Lion himself which is, of course, the only authority in Scotland that exists to grant arms. Signed by him is Robert Burns, and I've chosen just arbitrarily on this slide to actually date it the 5th day of March 1789. So this appeared in front of the Lord Lyon. He took jurisdiction. He decided that Robert Burns was a good and virtuous person. And then in the next slide, he issues a warrant 
a warrant instructing the Lion Clark to actually put in the register of all arms and bearings of Scotland, the arms of the petitioner, and in this case, Robert Burns. And in this case, you will see on the warrant itself that it's dated the 25th of January, 1793, but that's fictitious. And it outlines in the warrant what the blazon or the description of Robert Burns's arms have to be. And those arms were the arms that he described in his letter to his friend Cunningham on the 3rd of March, 1794, when he described himself as a wee bit of a herald. So it's fair to say that this our Scottish bard understood the language of heraldry that we know to be blazon. Once this is signed by the Lord Lion, it then goes to be entered into the register and also the drafting of letters patent to be signed by the Lord Lion, establishing that these arms belong now to Robert Burns and have all the protection that the court of the Lord Lion and the office of the Lord Lion can give them. In the next slide, you'll see the pattern of arms in favour of Robert Burns, a squire poet. And here, again, the arms are described. The Lord Lion is clearly identified as granting them. And also there is a seal and a signature of the Lord Lion to make this uh, a document that's verifiable and proper. When that's done, of course, and before the arms become into the ownership of Robert Burns, he needs to pay the bill. I looked out an account for the preparation of arms from the period of Robert Burns, and you'll see in this next slide that it comes to six pounds, 17 shillings and six pence. Well, don't get too excited, my friends, because you won't get arms for that price today. Uh, but that's what it cost at the time of Robert Burns. Six pounds, 17 shillings and six pence. And that included uh, three shillings for the vellum, one shilling for the box, five for the shillings for the seal, the painting, one pound and one shilling, and the actual exchequer dues to the court of the Lord Lion, five pounds and five shillings. So that account is, is one that would come from Robert Burns's time. So you can see that from that period right up to now, we've continued this practice that only once the exchequer fees and the costs are paid do the arms belong to the petitioner. The arms themselves, you might be wondering from the blazon, which you can read at your leisure, what they might look at. Well, in the next slide, you've got a black and white version of them with the two mottos, with the lovely pastoral activity of the pipe and the shepherd's crook with all its meanings. And there is almost another talk to talk through what Robert Burns's arms represent in his life. In the next slide, I was very privileged to have Mark Dennis advocate and, and Ross Herald extraordinary in his last office within the court of the Lord Lion, paint Robert Burns's arms in the 18th century style. For those of you who are heraldrists might see that the mantling, which is the around about the top of the achievement near the helmet is in red and white because that was the standard mantling used and the rules that we use for mantling are somewhat different. And this is how Robert Burns' his arms might have been painted in the 18th century when he was granted them. And finally, let me get into the, the last slide. Now, it was a great delight for me, after I'd written an article in a number of magazines called A New Coat for the Bard, to be petitioned by the, the Robert Burns World Federation to be, to be granted arms 
for and on behalf of Robert Burns posthumously. It was something that had been done in the past, uh, and I decided that it was something that needed to be looked at in its totality in terms of the massive contribution that Robert Burns has made, not only in his own time and with his volumes of poetry, but actually the impact he's had internationally in promoting Scotland. And I agreed at, with the, the petitioners to grant him supporters, which were in a sense to show his eminence as the national bard of Scotland. The shield you'll see, is clearly the same shield as Robert Burns looked for himself. His crest with the woodlark is his own crest and his mottos are his crest. And mottos are also his own mottos from his letter to Cunningham. But the supporters are additions. The supporters are the farmer's collie and Tam Ashanta's mare with her tail ripped off and then there is the Brigadoon with the waters and the grassy banks on either side. And I leave you to look at the grassy banks and see if you can find what I think is a bit of heraldic genius in terms of its painting. And that's the wee field moose representing his poem to a moose. So this was granted under my hand and is now in the possession of the Robert Burns World Federation to mark respect as we do on 25th of January celebrations throughout the world to our national bard and all that he offers to us. Let me now just finish with a few final comments which is on this last site slide. For me, there is a magnificent example of Scottish life and how it has infiltrated internationally in Robert Burns. And the granting of him of the arms that he asked for and with the additional additaments to what he has offered to Scotland, for me, is something that was very special indeed and showed the substantial contribution he made to Scottish life. As for my part, with regard to history, it speaks for itself. From Abraham Lincoln to the present Dalai Lama, and to that matter, to the current Lord Lyon himself, have all quoted from the works of Burns. You are listening to this, are all testimony in your presence to the interest that Robert Burns has created and to the contribution he has made to Scotland and Scottish life. I think there is no finer way of marking his contribution by the granting of an achievement of arms to him, albeit late and after he had passed from this life. As a lover of Burns, let me leave you with a simple verse that warms my heart and is always a verse that's before me in trying to be a good person, as Robert Burns, I believed, tried to be. The verse is, then gently scan your brother man, still gentler sister woman, though they may gain a kenning rang to step aside as human. Thank you for listening.